uh, welcome back uh, from your weekends. Um, not this week, but next week on Monday is your last midterm of the semester, midterm number five. Um, and it'll have uh, these lecture top topics on it, genetics, genes, viruses and bacteria, which is what we're on now, and uh, DNA technology. Now I need to fine tune what I'm telling you here. Um, part of the chapter on genetics you did uh, on the previous midterm, uh, but part of that is gonna come up again on this midterm. It's this, you should study all the genetic diseases If you look at your uh, lecture handout on genetics, eventually in that handout it starts talking about genetic diseases. Um, and so everything from the genetic diseases onward. And just to, just to name a few things that'll be on there. Um, incomplete dominance. Codominance. Yeah, again, I know I recovered these on the uh, on the uh, previous uh, midterm, but they're going to they're come up again on this one. And some of the stuff that we didn't get to cover on the previous midterm: um, sex-linked genes, uh, chromosomal abnormalities. If I had to simplify all that, I guess I would say just go to the part of the handout where it starts talking about genetic diseases and everything in the handout from that point and beyond uh, will be on, there'll be questions on it on midterm number five. Genes was this chapter we finished, I guess, last week talking about uh, promoters and how the introns are spliced out, uh, that sort of thing. The chapter we're on now. And the DNA technology chapter, we haven't started yet, but on Wednesday of this week, uh, I will start it as part of the pre-laboratory lecture. And we probably won't get through the whole thing when I start it on Wednesday, uh, but just, just however much we do get through this week will be the part that's on the, uh, on the uh, midterm. Is that uh, clear enough so far? Um, all right, and four laboratories will be on there, but some of these overlap a lot with the lecture material. For instance, the labs you did on genetics were essentially just going over problems that we learned about in the, in the lecture. And the laboratory on genes to proteins that we did last week was essentially a lab going over some of the concepts that we learned in the genes lecture. Alrighty. All right, so it's uh, unclear, come up and talk to me uh, after the lecture today and I'll, I'll go over it with you. Okay, well, let's uh, jump back into the viruses and uh, bacteria lecture. I had uh, finished up on viruses last week and just started in on uh, the prokaryotes. So maybe jump in, that's where I'll jump back in. Uh, the prokaryotes, of course, are uh, that. the prokaryotes are the species that we find in the bacteria kingdom and the archaea kingdom, and of course, their defining characteristic is they are prokaryotes, meaning they don't have any nucleus uh, around their DNA. Um, they've got some other traits, even though that's the defining trait of being a prokaryote. They have some other traits. They only have one chromosome, and it's always a circular chromosome, uh, like you see there. They are all unicellular organisms. Their entire body is just one tiny little cell. Uh, and it is a tiny cell compared to our big old eukaryotic cells. I think I showed you this. This is the tip of a needle with some 
prokaryotes on it, some bacteria on it. But here's a slide I was looking for. This is a eukaryotic cell, actually one of your immune system cells, uh, eating some prokaryotes, these little green guys right there. And you can see the, the difference in size, which I guess is not too shocking. The eukaryotic cells are larger, more complex, more evolved cells than uh, simple little prokaryotic cells are. Prokaryotic cells are believed to have been the first type to have evolved on Earth. Um, they think the Earth is around 4.5 billion years old. But in uh, certain rocks, they find essentially little fossilized images w embedded within the rocks that they think are, are bacteria, or I should say prokaryotes, of around 3.8 billion years ago. Way before any eukaryotic cells evolved. And when they look at, the, again, the fossil record in the rocks, that's the only kind of evidence they have for any life on Earth for at least the next billion years on Earth. The, uh, the eukaryotic cells, geologically speaking, came along much, much later than the uh, prokaryotic cells did. Um, prokaryotic cells are the most numerous type on Earth. I think I mentioned last time that there's one handful of dirt has more bacteria in it than all the people living on the face of the earth. Um, and inside your intestines, there are some prokaryotes that live in there. They, they don't harm you. Uh, they basically di uh, feed off some of the uh, feces that, that your body can't digest. Um, and anyway, th there is actually more prokaryotic cells living in just your intestine than all of the regular eukaryotic cells that make up uh, the rest of your body. They, uh, prokaryotes divide very quickly, or I should say reproduce very quickly. They do a special type of cell division called binary fission uh, that's very rapid compared to the mitosis and meiosis that we talked about for eukaryotic cells. Um, under ideal conditions, prokaryotes can reproduce themselves about every 20 minutes, which is a phenomenal uh, uh, rate of growth. Uh, and maybe because they divide so so quickly, that's one of the reasons that there are so many of them uh, on the Earth. You find them in all sorts of habitats all over the Earth, some habitats that are so extreme that eukaryotic cells can't survive. This is a boiling hot spring, uh, the geothermal hot spring, as you find in some areas of the world, like Yellowstone National Park. And the conditions in there being, well, at the boiling point, are too extreme for example, for eukaryotic cells to survive, but there are prokaryotes that can live in there. And uh, the, the type of metabolism uh, that you find in prokaryotes is very diverse compared to what you find in eukaryotes. And what I mean by that is, when, I, when we talked about eukaryotes earlier, I just mentioned two basic types of metabolism. And when I mean metabolism here, I'm focusing on how they get their nutrients. I said there were autotrophs, And their defining characteristic is that they make their own nutrients, like plants making their own glucose from carbon dioxide and water. And when we were in that part of the semester, I said in contrast, there were things like our cells, which are called heterotrophs. And these are organisms that can't make their own nutrients. They have to get them from outside sources, like eating food. Well, in the prokaryotic realm, you find organisms that, that do fit into both of those categories, but you find ones that, in a way, are outside those two categories. 
Uh, so what I'm saying is you can find some prokaryotes who are autotrophs just like plants do. They can do photosynthesis to make their own glucose using the energy of sunlight. And you find some prokaryotes that are clearly heterotrophs that uh, break down dead organisms, for example, and get nutrients from, by feeding on uh, those, those dead organisms, for example. But you find other ones that don't really fit neatly into those two categories. I remember reading about this one uh, type of um, uh, uh, prokaryote that gets most of its nutrients from outside organisms, but it supplements its ATP supply with the light dependent reaction. And remember the light dependent reaction when we studied photosynthesis, that was the part of photosynthesis that generates ATP from sunlight. And in plants, remember that ATP went over the Calvin cycle to help the plant make its own nutrients. Well, here we have the light dependent reaction making ATP, but it's not using it to fix carbon dioxide into glucose, it's just using it to get, make a little ATP more for itself. It still has, gets its own nutrients from outside. So, you know, is that an autotroph or is it not? Well, it's, it's kind of somewhere in between. It's kind of hard to place it in any one definite category. It's definitely using sunlight, but not really to make its own food. Um, and there's some other borderline uh, examples along those lines. Um, th there are some types of uh, prokaryotes that do run something like the Calvin cycle. That, that is, they're able to take carbon dioxide and make glucose out of it. So you'd say, okay, that's, that's an autotroph, so what? It's just like a plant. But they don't use sunlight to, to make the ATP for it. Some of these prokaryotes can extract energy from minerals like, like iron in their environment. And by extracting energy from the minerals, they make ATP, which they use to, to fix carbon dioxide. So clearly an autotroph, it is making its own nutrients, but it's not doing, photosyn it's not doing photosynthesis style autotroph. It's getting its ATP from, from non-light sources, from things like iron and other minerals. Uh, anyway, so there's, they're extremely diverse in habitat and in, in how they uh, get, their, get their nutrients. All righty, well, let's look at the archaea and the uh, bacteria uh, domains a little more closely and see what they're all about. And uh, let's start off with the uh, archaea. They uh, used to think the archaea were just a type of bacteria. They were, they were originally classified as just a, an odd sort of bacteria. And you know, in a way, you can't blame early biologists for thinking that because archaea, just like the bacteria, are prokaryotic cells, and a nucleus, and a circular chromosome. So yeah, why not? Why wouldn't you just think of them as, as a type of bacteria? Come on in. But uh, as uh, the science of biology progressed, and they were able to look a little bit more closely at the genes and the type of biological molecules that they were made out of, they began to see that they were actually very distinct from the bacteria. For instance, the, the types of lipids you find in their membrane, um, the cell wall, the sequences of the genes were very, very distinct from the bacteria. And so now they've moved them over to their, uh, to their own domain. Um, so, so from a biochemical standpoint and genetic standpoint, they are clearly distinct. They're usually described like this as the prokaryotes that live in extreme environments, um, rather than defining them from a biochemical standpoint, because that, that is a, a good way to think about them. They, they think that the archaea live in environments that were actually closer to the, the beginning of the Earth, when the Earth was still had a lot of I don't know, geothermal, geothermal activity. Um, and, and that's where you still find the prokaryotes living. As a matter of fact, they think that the, that, that the archaea were probably the first prokaryotes to evolve. They probably came before uh, the bacteria did. And uh, let me tell you about some of these extreme environments that you do find them in. One type of these archaea uh, are called the thermophiles. 
And these are the ones, I guess I mentioned a couple minutes ago, they can live in boiling hot springs, uh, like you find in, well, various regions of the, of the Earth, like Yellowstone here in the United States. And I guess in Northern California, there's some boiling hot springs also. And I know Iceland has a lot of uh, hot springs as well. And what's going on here is that just below the, the surface, the ground, there are some pools of, of molten lava. And that lava heats up the water that seeps into the ground and brings it, well, actually to above boiling temperature. Um, and yet, you know, and, and this, this would kill uh, eukaryotes or, or bacteria, but the, some of the archaea have adapted to these uh, super hot conditions. And in this class, I've been emphasizing that enzymes usually